Thank you for coming to the premier event of our premier speaker series. We really are glad to have you here this evening. My name is Leslie Perry. I'm the nurse here at Hereford High School. I'm a member of the Hereford Zone University Board of Directors. We feel really proud of that title. Um, I also have Allison over here, who is a math teacher here and works with our um, student government. And we have Molly Esworthy, who's an associate worker, who's also on our board of directors. And she works over here in school. Um, and then we have two other members. One's at the graduate program. Meg Jones is a member of our set, uh, is the uh, chair of our SAD program, and is at uh, graduate school tonight. And um, Jill Watkins, who teaches math, who also co-chairs uh, student government, and she's on maternity leave. So you three of us here today. So we thank you very much. Um, I'm just not going to say a lot about Greg. So he can tell you about himself, but he's a former math teacher in Baltimore City Schools, and I missed being his school nurse by a year. In fact, he was really kind of fun. He went to high school, middle school, and he graduated, and I started there the next year. So I can't claim to have done anything really good great for me in middle school, but he went back to teach middle school. So anyway, thank you very much for coming, and if you have any questions you wanted to send, there's a tiny URL that's on the um, little triangle board there. You can send your, you can, you can live feed your, Feed your questions to us, and we will answer them as we go on, or at the end, if they, depending on how to work it out. So if you have questions, please feel free to send them up. Thank you very much. I've been doing this work for 12 years. I started when I was 15. I was just a volunteer. 
Um, and today I'm executive director. So it's really great student leadership, and it's really important for me, and I just really commend the uh, Hereford community for inviting me here today. Um, and so what we're going to learn about is a whole bunch of LGBT stuff. I'm going to present that to you. Some of the guidelines for today. First of all, we want to take advantage to learn something new. So I don't know about you, but I talk about LGBT stuff all the time. Maybe you don't, unless it's like an awkward Thanksgiving dinner with granddad. He brings up Caitlyn Jenner, and you're like, oh, God, pass the potatoes, please. Um, so we want to take the advantage to talk out LGBT stuff, because maybe we don't talk about it enough. Um, I want you to lean into any discomfort or unfamiliarity that you might face today. So we're talking about LGBT issues, which can be polarizing, can be confusing for some folks who aren't part of the community. And I might say some things that you aren't familiar with, that might make you a little uncomfortable. And what I want to challenge you to do is when you feel a little uncomfortable, listen up even more, right? Because we believe that once you start to lose your footing, that's the best fertile ground for learning, right? So once you start to feel a little weird, like, oh, I don't really know what you already said, honestly, don't shut down. Listen up a little bit more. Please use the tiny URL to ask me tons of questions. Um, it's my pleasure to do this work and to give you this information. So I want to make sure you lead with everything you came for today. Um, so lead into that discomfort. Also consider your own identity. So like I said, I used to teach middle school. And middle school can be tough for some folks. And I'm sure if we asked people, like, how was your middle school experience? There might be some good stories, but there might be some really bad, you know, embarrassing stories as well. So the topics that I'm going to talk about today around respect, empathy, um, harassment, these things are not just reserved for the LGBT community. All of us at some point have felt weird for some reason, whether we were too tall or too fat or too short or whatever it is. And so when we talk about equity and education and making sure that all students have you know, an access to a good education, everyone can get on board with that because all of us maybe have felt weird for some reason at some time. And then of course we want to keep the goal in mind. And I say this a lot to teachers that when I go around to professional development and trainings, my goal isn't really to change your personal or religious beliefs. If I do change them, that's great. Rainbow flags are $6 on Amazon.com. <laughs> go ahead and buy one. Trans flags are there too. Buy flags, whatever you want. Um, but that's not what my goal is. My goal is to give you information to let you know how schools can become safe and supportive and welcoming places for all students. We believe that from 745 to 245, whenever the bell rings, that every student should feel safe and supported and have access to a good education. So that's what we're here to do. Um, so our objectives, we're going to become just a little bit more knowledgeable about what LGBT youth experience in schools. I think that if you were to ask anyone, they'd say, okay, you might have it tough, but I want to quantify some of that. I want to give you some data. Um, Listen really prides itself on its data collection and its statistics. So I want to show you exactly what is happening in schools. What are the experiences of LGBT youth? And I'll present national, state, and local data for you so you understand exactly. And unfortunately, they all tell the same story, right? Uh, we want folks to feel better equipped to speak up, intervene. I understand that most of the folks in the audience are parents. And so it's really good because you might have a young person who identifies as LGBT, but you might not really have the language in your arsenal to speak up or intervene or communicate with them about their identity. So hopefully once I demystify some of the words, some of the concepts, you can say, okay, I understand where this young person is coming from, and maybe I can have a conversation around it. And of course, we want to identify some resources to support LGBT youth. I'm one of them, I'm Jabari, i in Maryland, but there are others. We're lucky because we're in Baltimore, uh, close to Baltimore City. When we do this work all over the state, if I'm in Garrett County or St. Mary's, they don't really have a lot of LGBT resources. Um, so it's one of our really big goals and values to reach people who are in more rural, conservative communities um, to make sure that we spread this information as well. <coughs> so we're going to jump in. Um, oh, I love that I have a clock there because uh, one of my old mentors, her name was Kay, before I became a teacher, she said, Jabari, I know you're going to become a teacher because you're really smart, you're really nice, and you love to hear yourself talk. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I can sort of ramble on a little bit, but I'm glad that there's a clock there. <laughs> yes, the good old gender unicorn. I heard some giggles. Um, so we're going to use a unicorn to talk through some of the vocabulary. Believe it or not, vocabulary is a big deal in this community, right? There's so many words and so many concepts to describe how somebody might arrive at their identity. Some young people really love labels. It makes them feel a part of a community. 
Some young folks don't. Um, however, these young people today know these words better than me, better than any of us. And it's important to just know a little bit about what the words mean, a little bit of the concepts so that we can understand how can someone arrive at their gender identity, or what is sexual orientation, and how is it conflated with attraction, and all of those things. To explain this, I'm going to use a unicorn. How gay is that, right? A unicorn? That was a joke. You can laugh at that joke. <laughs> Does my little laser work? Oh, fancy. Okay, great. So this is a unicorn on purpose. It's not supposed to be any individual person. It can be any person. So make sure you can see yourself in this unicorn. You can see anybody. The things I'm going to talk about when it comes to one's gender identity, their gender expression, their sexual and romantic orientation, their sex assigned at birth, these are things that every single person in this room has. These are not reserved for the LGBT community. All of us have gender identity. All of us have sex assigned at birth, if we are humans. And so it makes sense that there's tons of diversity. There's seven billion people on the planet. This can get a little complicated, but I'm gonna do my best to take you through it and have you understand. We're gonna spend a considerable amount of time on talking about transgender and gender non-conforming youth. It's really important, particularly these days, where trans issues are becoming more in vogue and trans students need our support more than ever in school. Um, so I'm gonna spend a lot of time on that. So I'm gonna start at sex assigned at birth. So you're born. Well, you come out, the doctor looks at you, it inspects your genitalia and your chromosomes. And the doctor makes a check on a paper based on what the doctor sees, based on what the doctor inspects. That's called your sex assigned at birth. We call it sex assigned at birth because it was a sign made by a doctor or a medical professional. And it's based on science. It's based on biology. It's what you show up with. So the doctor might look at you and might check male or female based on what the doctor sees. I'm going to flip back and forth between these big table of words. So you might see that the sign sex could be female or male based on what the doctor sees. But there's also this other one called intersex. Raise your hand if you've heard, if you've heard that term before, intersex. OK, a couple of people. Raise your hand if you've heard the word hermaphrodite before. OK, always more hands shoot up for that. Right? So hermaphrodite is a word that we don't use anymore. It's medically inaccurate, it's oppressive, it's disrespectful, it's based on some weird Greek mythology. We don't do it anymore. Right? So we don't use the term hermaphrodite, we use the term intersex. And right now I'm talking about a doctor's assignment at birth. Intersex, what that means is that this young person possesses a medical anomaly in which their biological sex cannot be easily determined based on what the doctor sees. So maybe this young person displays both genitalia, or neither, or one and some other chromosomes. There's all types of reasons why a young person may identify or may be assigned intersex at birth. The reason we include intersex people in the LGBT community, and of course some of you may have heard the acronyms LGBTQIATS star question mark shopping cart. You know, there's so many words in the acronym. But when we talk about one's sex assigned at birth and its relation to somebody's gender identity, we see sometimes that parents don't always get it right. So we're talking about sex assigned at birth. The doctor makes that check. However, what we understand is because that doctor made that check on that paper that day, that has little to nothing to do with how a young person really sees themselves in our world, in our society. And when I'm talking about how a young person really sees and understands themselves, I'm talking about gender. And we have been taught, and we as a society, conflate gender and sex all the time. We've all taken applications, and it might ask us sex, M or F. You take another application, it'll say gender, M or F. So fundamentally in our language, we don't understand the difference between gender and sex. What I'm here to offer you today is that someone's sex assigned at birth and their gender identity are two different things. They're not the same. So just because a doctor made an assignment on that one day and checked that box, that really has nothing to do with how this young person might know their hair to look, might know how their voice sounds, might know how they fit into this societal, cultural understanding that we call gender. So even though sex assigned at birth is very biological, very scientific, 
That is not the same as one's gender identity. And someone's gender identity, again, is based on cultural and societal norms and practices. What it means to be a man or a woman in America is sometimes different all around the world. And so that just goes to show that societies make their own understandings of gender. And so perhaps the most important thing that I could leave you with today is understanding that sex and gender are not the same. Now, there are some of us that our sex assigned at birth matches the gender that we identify with. I'm going to use myself as an example. When I was born, the doctor said, it's a boy. And today, I identify still as a boy or a man. You might call me cisgender. Cis is a Latin root. It means same, C-I-S. There might be some science people in here that know about cis bonds and all that stuff. And so the definition of a cisgender person is someone who has a gender identity that is the same as their sex assigned at birth, or that's traditionally linked to that sex. Most people in our country are cisgender. I'm a cisgender person. However, we know that there are some people, when they think about their gender identity, and again, gender identity is your internal understanding of who you are in terms of gender, it may or may not link to that sex assigned at birth. When your gender identity does not link or does not match your sex assigned at birth, we may use the word transgender for you. And the definition of a transgender person is someone who has a gender identity that differs from their sex assigned at birth. Now, there are all types of ways that folks can arrive at their gender identity. Not everyone understands their gender identity when they're young. We know that some people have a very unique understanding of their gender as early as age three or four. However, there are some folks who don't understand their gender identity until their 50s or their 60s. It's a personal battle, it's a personal journey, just like coming out, just like anything else. And so I want to talk a little bit about transgender folks, how they transition, who they are. The first thing is understanding that there are more than two genders. In our society, we believe very closely in a gender binary. So man, woman, on, off, one, two. Well, of course, there's seven billion people on the planet. There has to be more than two genders, right? Now, there are some people who they say, yes, man makes sense for me. That gender, that cultural understanding of what a man is, I identify with that. That's good for me. There are some folks who identify squarely as women. However, there are some folks that when they think about their gender, their gender exists somewhere outside of this binary. When they think about their gender, they say, you know what? Neither man nor woman makes sense for me. I understand culturally and societally what a man is and what a woman is, and neither makes sense. And so we might call some of those folks genderqueer, non-binary, gender non-conforming. These are folks that have a gender identity outside of the binary and they understand that their gender is neither squarely man or woman. Maybe it's a combination of both. Maybe it's neither. And so gender is very personal, and not everyone has the same story. Not everyone arrives at their gender in the same way. But it's important for you to understand and allow yourselves to understand that yes, there are more than two genders, and gender is cultural, and that when a person understands their gender, it sometimes is neither man or woman. Now this can be really confusing for us because many adults were not taught this in health class, they weren't taught this in sex ed, and so it just seems like this newfangled thing that young people are coming up with and they don't know what they're talking about. The truth is transgender and gender non-conforming people have been around forever. However, today we have the social climate, we have the vernacular, we have the words, that we can actually discuss things like gender identity in a way that we maybe couldn't even 15 years ago. And so the idea of being transgender or gender non-conforming is not new. There are plenty of historical accounts of transgender people throughout history holding positions of power, being lauded by their societies. However, today, because it's been a little bit more in vogue and young people are putting and emblazoning their identities way more confidently, we can talk about gender identity. And so some gender identities here, like I said, non-binary, gender non-conforming, gender queer, gender fluid. One of the best ways you can support a transgender youth, a trans person, anyone, 
is to respect their name and their pronouns. That's the best way. We do it with our dogs and our pets all the time. So somebody comes over and they say, oh, your dog, she's so cute. And you go, it's a boy. He. <laughs> it could be a fish, a cat, whatever. So we have such gendered lenses as Americans, as humans. We go down a shaving cream aisle, there's a big blue can, a big pink can. It's the same stuff inside. And I bet you the pink can is $2 more expensive. <laughs> That's the pink tag. That's a different talk. So it's so important that we degender our lenses and understand that we've been given this understanding that everything fits in one or two. However, here are a couple of gender, um, I'm sorry, pronouns that folks can identify with. If someone identifies as a man, they may use the pronouns he or him. And of course, a pronoun in the English box is a word that we use in place of a proper noun, right? So you know that I am Jabari, I identify as he. You would say, Jabari, he is giving this presentation. I'm listening to him now. Someone who identifies as a woman may use she or her. However, some folks who are not binary or genderqueer may choose to use the pronoun they or them. Now, there are some grumbly English people who are like, that's plural. You can't use they, them for just one person. Well, I'm here to say, yes, you can, and you should. In fact, it's already in our language. Let's say that you're at a party and they say, someone left their keys here. Let's get it back to them. You're certainly not talking about a group of people who lost their keys. You're talking about one person. And so let's not have language and grammar be a function of oppression, right? And let's go ahead and change our language and understand and trust that when someone uses the pronouns they or them, they're talking about themselves, and they're saying that he or she would not work for me. Why? Because I don't identify with that gender. And so they and them are pronouns that some people may use. The way you can use it, I have a staff person, their name is Kiwi. I spoke to them yesterday, I'm gonna see them tomorrow, they're great. Right, I'm talking about Kiwi, one person. Other pronouns, Z and here. So that's when I get people that are like, oh, this is a different language. Right, I'm done. Now, I've been doing this work for 12 years, I do a lot of gay stuff, and I've only met two people who use the pronoun Z in here. So I don't want you to get boggled down and say, oh gosh, I gotta remember all these pronouns, and I gotta carry around this unicorn, and circle around and be like, well, what are you? That's not what I'm here to do. It's for you just to know these things exist, and to know that when a young person says, hey, this is my name, please use these pronouns for me, that you know, okay, I understand that. Z and he are pronouns that you can use. Or Z and Z. These are pronouns that folks feel comfortable with that don't want to use he or she or that. And the way you would use it is if I use those pronouns, you'd say, Jabari, Z is giving this presentation. I'm listening to them now. Some people might say, well, how will I know? How will I know to use the correct pronouns? So I'm going to talk a little bit about transition. Trans folks transition in many different ways. However, our society, and particularly the media, romanticizes this whole thing about surgery. We've all seen the Ricky Lake shows, right, where they bust out of the paper, and they're like, yeah, that was you, you were 12, and now you look like this bombshell. <laughs> it's really weird, right? What that does is it imparts our own beauty standards on transgender folks. Trans folks, they transition in all different types of ways. It can be just a social transition, where they say, this is my name, these are my pronouns. No surgery, no hormone, nothing like that. They are trans enough. Transgender identity, or gender identity, if you look, is coming out of this unicorn's head. So transgender identity has nothing to do with one's body. It's important to know that. It's important to realize that there are some trans folks who do elect to go through hormone therapy, where they'll actually take chemicals to alter their bodies to make them look the way that they feel like they should look, or go through some type of medical transition or medical procedure to make their bodies look the way that they can. However, we can't think that all trans folks are a single story. And we also can't validate the trans folks who look good to us, right? Like, oh, you see a trans woman and I wouldn't even know. That's one of those things that like, cisgender people say. They're like, mm, don't. Right? 
It's important to judge and understand that not all trans people are going to look the way that you think they should look. So there are going to be some trans girls, and when I say trans girl, I'm talking about someone who's sex assigned at birth may have been male, but their gender identity, who they are, they are a girl, trans girls are girls. And you're going to see some trans girls who might not look like girls to you. And you're going to meet some trans boys who might not look like boys to you, your traditional understanding of what a boy looks like. But again, we cannot impart single stories on all trans folks. That some people are very comfortable with how they look. So what I'm talking about a little bit right now is our gender expression. And notice that gender expression are these dots. So we've talked about gender identity. Gender expression is how we're communicating gender to you. The choices that we make. So today, I made a choice to wear this shirt and these jeans and this short hair and if you would see me on the street, you'd be like, okay, that's probably a man, right? Those are, that's my gender expression. Those are the choices that I'm making. Now, again, you may see someone, and you don't you want to be well-meaning. You don't want to use the wrong pronouns for them. But I promise you that trans folks would rather you ask than assume what their gender is. And it's all about how you ask, too. So it's not like, oh, what are you? Right? What do I call you? You can say something as simple like, hi, what pronoun should I use for you? That's a simple, easy way, and they say, okay, I use they, them pronouns, or I use he, him pronouns. Thank you so much. A really inclusive practice that I used to do in my classroom is at the beginning of the year, everyone would say their pronouns. Because you can't just assume somebody's gender based on, again, your gaze, what you think they are. And we don't just share pronouns when we think a trans person is around. It's important to share pronouns and know who folks are. So if you ever have a question about somebody's gender identity or what pronouns they use, you can politely ask and say, hey, I'm just so sorry, what pronouns do you use? What pronouns feel good for you? Which pronouns should I use? Also, it's important to know, if you are a parent and you've known your child for a really long time with this one name or these one pronouns, of course you're going to go through a period of confusion, a period of grief, almost, where you have to now unlearn this one young person and then now learn about a new young person. And sometimes we're going to slip up. Teachers slip up, they make mistakes. They forget, they misgender. And when I say misgender, that's using someone's incorrect pronouns. However, many trans youth and trans adults know the difference between an earnest and honest slip up or are you just choosing to not use their pronouns because you just don't want to? And trust me, I've met teachers who say, it says Melissa on the paper, I'm gonna say Melissa, I'm gonna use she, and that's it. That's different from being like, Melissa, oh, I'm so sorry, James. So if you're making an earnest effort to respect a young person's name and their pronouns, we see you, we understand that, and that's a lot different. So, gender expression, of course we can be feminine or masculine, we know what that means. You may see some words in my chart that have quotations around them. Those are words that we just have to be a little careful about, right? My good rule is that if a young person or any person uses these words first to identify themselves, then you should feel comfortable using them. However, if they have not used the words, it's probably not good for you to use it. So, I wouldn't say something like, oh, I was talking to this butch girl the other day. What does that mean? Now there are some people who readily use that as a part of their identity. They say, yes, I'm a butch lesbian, that's who I am. And of course the word butch means something a little more masculine. But let young folks lead. Let them educate you about their identity. Especially if it's a new young person who you don't know. And they say, you know, how do you identify? Let's say they spit off all these words. You can just simply say, well, what does that mean to you? And that will give them an opportunity to describe, oh, when I met this and this that. So these are all different gender expressions that folks can have. It's important to know that not everyone's gender expression is going to match their gender identity. So for example, every Halloween for the past four Halloweens, I was Miss Frizzle on Halloween. Anyone remember Magic School Bus? Okay. Yes, I was a huge black Miss Frizzle. It was amazing. And I had the lizard. Didn't have the bus. That was my gender expression on Halloween. Right? However, my gender identity never changed. So if you see, let's say, someone who you know as a young lady, and she's coming to school one day in a suit and tie, 
That's just the gender expression she chose that day. That doesn't necessarily mean that's her gender identity. And it's tricky because all of these things, none of them match up. So just because you know someone's sex assigned at birth, you really know nothing about their gender identity. And just because you know their gender identity, you really know nothing about how they're going to express that gender. So it's important to ask questions respectfully. Now, this is an LGBT conversation. I haven't once talked about who somebody might date, who somebody might love, who somebody might be attracted to, because that shows that gender is something completely different from sexuality. Right? And so we don't know who somebody might date just because we know something about their gender. We know nothing about that. And that's something completely different. So if we see this unicorn, this unicorn has two hearts, and that's talking about someone's sexual or romantic attraction. And we all have this. Again, you should think about yourself. What is your sex assigned at birth? What is your gender identity? What choices did you make for your gender expression? And we think about sexual and romantic attraction. Sexual attraction, I'm talking about physical attraction, arousal. Romantic attraction, I'm talking about intimacy and love. And right now, we're getting to human sexuality 201 right now. But it's important to know that for some humans, those things are not the same. Some of us, we are romantically attracted to the same people we are sexually attracted to. But for some folks, it's different. I'll give you an example. I had a friend of mine, he told me one day, you know, he knows I do LGBT work. And he said, you know, Jabari, I feel like I could physically be attracted to probably men or women. This is a cisgender man who's talking to me. He said, I feel like I could probably have a sexual relationship with someone who identifies as a man or a woman. However, when it comes to romance and holding hands and cuddling and marriage and all those things, I feel like I could really only do that with another woman. What he was describing to me was his difference in sexual and romantic attraction. That he had a certain sexual attraction that allowed him to be attracted to either men or women. However, his romantic attraction is only towards women. And again, this is mind-blowing. I see some of your faces in the audience and feel like, whoa, this is crazy. It's true. This is human sexuality. We know this because our young people really understand themselves as sexual beings. And when they describe things about their sexual identity or their gender identity, we need to just believe them because they understand and know who they are. Some sexual orientations, of course we know gay, that's like the boring one these days. Right? <laughs> yeah, well, you're just gay. <laughs> okay, lesbian is a word that we use for someone who's female identified and could be attracted to other women. And notice I said female identified. Because if a trans girl is dating another girl, she can call herself a lesbian. Caitlyn Jenner, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on her because I don't like her right now. But Caitlyn Jenner says that she dates other women. And so if she's a trans woman who dates other women, she could be a lesbian. Bisexuality is being changed a lot by young people today. It just means if you're attracted to two or more genders, you can be bisexual. Pansexuality is becoming a real popular one. And again, this isn't new. It's us educating and young people educating themselves and being like, wow, I've always felt this way, but there's a now a word for it that I know. Pansexuality, it depends on the Latin word pan, which means all. So like a panoramic picture, takes a picture of all, all the horizon. It just means that you're attracted to all of these genders. You're attracted to people regardless of their gender. Things he made. You just saw some of those statements, so I won't repeat them. But basically, when there's an awareness that there is a group of transgenders who exist and trying to find accommodations for it, and the building is safer, we went with the Maryland State Department of Education's guidelines, which, and the two lines in particular, provide access to restrooms that correspond to the student's gender identity and permit transgender and gender non-conforming students whose gender identity is not exclusively male or female to use the facilities that they believe are the most consistent with their safety and gender identity. So that's the policy we developed this year. We rolled it out. We monitored very closely. I know the kids in this building. I know them well. I've been in a number of other buildings in Baltimore County Schools, Baltimore City. I've been in private schools. I'm not sure you can pull this off in any other school, but it's working. We have, I guess, about 40 students who are in that group. 
30 to 40. On the outside, yeah. Right. And all of them had concerns. We, we talked, we mapped this out. We went through a long process. We thought about just designating a couple bathrooms in the building so that transgenders could use them. We talked about using exclusively the bathrooms that are in the nurse's health suite. And we talked about using a couple single bathrooms for the door that locks in the building. And for a number of reasons, as we developed and talked about these things, we found that it would be best to maybe open it up to all bathrooms in the school for a number of reasons. I presented this to the PTSA at the last meeting. They understood the reasons. They, they bought into it and supported it, and they have all along. Um, and, you know, all of the bathrooms in this building have stalls, whether they're on the urinals or whether they're in the actual toilets. The girls' room all have stalls. And this has not been a problem. We don't have kids who are, I'm going to use the word, warriors. We don't have males going in trying to seek out females and vice versa. Um, we have a system that seems to be working really well. And it works because the kids at Hereford, I think, truly recognize the transgenders and they truly respect what it is they're trying to be and what they're trying to do. Recently, I've been watching the whole kneel down football thing, which really came to fruition on Sunday. I've been listening to this thing going back and forth, and one of the things that I, I heard that really has come through loud and clear is that if you don't have a, a conversation about controversy, you never really get to the heart of the matter. And so I feel we had a good conversation last year and working into this, and I want it to be ongoing. I, I really appreciate you all coming out tonight. I wish, I sincerely wish, there were four or five hundred more of you here so that we could have a spirited conversation and talk about it. I am very much aware of the things when we started this policy this year that Facebook and the people on Facebook have been saying, as a principal, I need to be connected to that, and so I am, and I watch. And it's interesting to see the comments, and many of them are really formulated, the opinions and the comments are made without really having all the information and the work that went through it. Um, again, to reinforce what I did, um, I looked back last year, and we didn't have a policy last year. But really, what we're doing this year is what happened all last year. So I felt pretty confident that we would have the same pattern. I just felt that it was necessary to make sure I let parents and students know what was going on this year. I haven't had many parent calls. I haven't had many students. I have formed a group of students this year. I have formed a committee where I'm going to meet with students once a month this year and try and monitor this and other situations and other, and kind of keep the pulse of the school. Um, and I'll adjust the policy as the policy needs to be adjusted by feel that there's student concern, but it will be through conversation and discussion of all people. And somewhere down the road, I accept Baltimore County Schools will come up with a policy, and then hopefully I'll be able to meld what we're doing with theirs. And I, I promise you this, I will keep all parents in, involved, informed about what's taking place. I felt kind of um, vindicated, good, um, I was in New York this summer, and I was in uh, the theater district, and I went to a play, and I saw this sign. I, people thought it was a little weird, because I'm taking a picture of a men's room, you know, as you walk into it. But it had a sign up there, which was really interesting. It said, gender diversity is welcome here. And then it said, please use the restroom that best fits your gender identity of expression. And I thought, okay, well, you know, New York's doing it. Hereford High School can do it. And the other thing is, as I started walking around and had lunch, I noticed you know, bathrooms are, I learned, bathrooms are a, a marketable commodity in New York. You, you know, there's a lot of people there and there are lines and everything. So, like even 7-Eleven had a sign up there that said diversity is welcome, you know, use the bathroom. And when you walked into the bathroom, when I walked into these bathrooms, because I'm kind of checking the bathrooms out to see how they're constructed, they don't have stalls that separate. They're just, you know, it's all right out there. Um, and, you know, there are urinals here, 25 of them, and there's stalls here. And, you go to the, the ladies' rooms, they don't have front doors on them. Um, I didn't walk in, I was told that. <laughs> but my point is, 
I think that we're in a good spot right here in Hereford, the way the renovation has left the stalls and the way that things have taken place. I saw on Facebook a number of things that said things like, uh, well, you know, Jari, he uses the private bathroom off the principal's office. There is no private bathroom off the principal's office, and I do use student bathrooms all day long, Not mostly because I like to keep a, 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 a informed of what's going on out in my halls and in my bathrooms. and what the new graffiti is on the walls has been written about me and see if I'm ahead of Emily and Will or Will are ahead of me in terms of what we biologically can't do, <laughs> regardless of, you know, your, your sex or anything. But it's a system that I think is working. Um, I wanted to have the opportunity this evening to just express to you um, what Hereford is doing and where Baltimore County Public Schools is. I think there will be a policy. I think this is something that's ongoing, and I think that it's not going to go away. And I think when Jabari talked last year, I realized that in the spring. Um, he's an excellent resource of information. And when I crunched some of his statistics and the, the numbers and what was taking place, it just made logical sense to create a space for the transgenders, or for the LGBTQ kids, and to make sure that they had a voice. So for better or worse, that's kind of where things rest right now. So I think that's everything I wanted to say. Be glad to open it up to questions. Questions for Jabari, questions for me. Uh, I did want to do one quick thing, and that is thank the individuals who put this together this evening. Um, Sam Tillman had a big part of this. Thank you all the Thank you, Terry. Uh, thank Hamilton, who's not here this evening. And Allison Zane. Did I get them all? And Jill Watkins and Jill Watkins. So the teachers who I think put this together and saw it. Jabari either I ticked them off and he's left me or he's oh okay, yeah, just went together. All right. Questions? Can I answer any uh, can I answer questions or do you have any? Or and if, 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 if Yep, okay. I'll let I'll give it to someone else. And I think Leslie, tell me if this is true. Afterwards they'll stick around for a couple minutes if there's individual. Alright. I just said it now so you probably have to. First question we have, sure. Um, we only have one question on here. So if you are brave enough to put your questions on the tiny URL and come up here as anonymous, I won't know who you are. First one is for Jabari though. Um, what is the best way to identify students who are transgender in a giant group? What is the terminology that is most Yeah, I think I understand what the question is getting to, and it's something that I forgot to mention in my presentation, just a little grammar note, um, and it possibly would have helped with Mr. Jairo's language. So transgender is an adjective, right? So um, we don't use transgender as a noun, so that we can't say, oh, I just saw a bunch of transgenders, right? You saw a bunch of people who identify as transgender. Um, and so we also don't use transgender as a verb. So you don't say that somebody's transgendered. Like, where'd you go get that done, right? Um, <laughs> transgender is an adjective. And again, those are just those small grammar notes that sometimes folks who are completely well-meaning um, might not know, right? And so in order to be a really good ally to trans folks, we just really police our language and make sure that we understand that we use transgender as an adjective um, and not as a noun. Um, and so we will excuse. Um, so I have a really funny story about Mr. Jira. Mr. Jira was actually my assistant principal when I was in middle school, which is adorable. Um, and I got into a fight one time when I was in seventh grade, and there was this dude who kept calling me a name. His name was Paris. I don't know if you remember this. <laughs> and I was a good kid, right, in middle school, and uh, really involved. And he was punching me on the bus one day. And I got like a bad grade in math or something, so I was like really upset. And I punched the kid in the face. It's the only time that I've ever hit like anyone, other than my little brother. And so we go to the principal's office, and everyone felt really victorious for me because I was being bullied, and this kid was in sixth grade. I was in seventh grade, and I was obviously larger than him. So we go to Mr. Jira's office, and Mr. Jira goes, oh, I know Jabari. Jabari is a good kid. If he had to hit you, then you were doing something wrong. <laughs> so Mr. Jira suspended the kid <laughs> and not me. And that's a story that I tell all the time. And so I really appreciate his leadership and 
you know, really taking it on the right side of the issue. I hope more high schools in Baltimore County and around the state really do follow Hereford's lead. Um, I appreciate that he's listening to the community, listening to teachers, um, and making sure the schools are safe. So I had to tell that story. <laughs> Sure, sure. Um, if they are a teacher, the best narrative or the best advice that I can give them is if you are in the business of caring for and protecting and educating young people, then you need to do whatever it takes to make sure that young people feel safe and supported in your care. It's kind of like the Hippocratic Oath, right? Do no harm. And so we know that there are some teachers who might not be on board with the whole LGBT thing. And again, I said that my goal isn't really to change those beliefs. My goal is to make sure that teachers understand the strategies, the language, the know-how, the tools, to make sure from the time they clock in to the time they clock out, that they are not doing any harm to young folks. So I would um, probably advise that if this young, if this you know, co-worker's actions or language you know, are coming out in such a way that young people feel unsafe, um, and that's a real issue. However, sometimes as educators, we have to check our beliefs at the door um, and make sure that we are doing the best thing we can to create a safe learning environment. Um, so that's the advice I would give to that teacher is to make sure that you just are presenting a safe environment, that you're not doing any harm to young people, and then you can go home with your beliefs. And so let me, let me also just say this. So, you know, my inappropriate use of language um, is getting better, but I am very much aware that this is new territory for me, so I can only imagine for some teachers what it involves. But I think, you know, Sam Tillman did an excellent job at the beginning of this year before school started. We devoted a good bit of time to the same kinds of things that Jabari is doing right now. And I think the more information we get to teachers, the more comfortable they get with it. We have good teachers in this building, you know, but everybody comes from different backgrounds. Every comes, everyone comes from different stereotypes, you know, from drawing stereotypes. But I think that we're in the process now of just kind of forging new territory and trying to fall, find out where the comfort zone is and where to fall with it. And I think that the more information that we continue to bring in and, and the more teachers become informed, I think the more comfortable they become with it. And so my intent is to continue this, this level of information and education and continue with these kinds of presentations, not only for the teachers, but I think also for the parents and for the kids. I think that the same kinds of situations, maybe more so, exist with other kids in the building than they do with some of the teachers. So I think we're on the vanguard of this, just starting to approach it, but I am committed to working with it because I think at the end of the day, I'm not doing my job if I'm not providing a safe environment for all kids. So that's the goal. We have a few more questions on here. Um, I'm going to go with, from the student perspective, how do you deal with a teacher you know who is closed minded? From a student perspective. From a student perspective. Um, it's all about what that young person feels comfortable with and the relationship that the young person has with the teacher. Um, so if they feel comfortable enough to say, hey, you know, you know my Mr. Lyles, what you said yesterday just made me it feel so great, right? Um, and this is why, and you know, could you talk a little bit more about why you use that language? If the young person feels comfortable enough to have that conversation, then they should. If not, they should seek other resources in the building, other adults that can have that conversation, um, possibly administration or school counseling. Um, to say, you know, hey, I have a teacher that maybe is saying not so nice things or, um, you know, saying using not so nice language. Um, could be sort of strategized around how to remedy that. Um, so I don't want to say that, you know, all youth should feel to advocate for themselves, right? Because as adults, we sort of have to advocate for young folks. Um, but some uh, students have close relationship with teachers, and so if you feel like you can have a conversation, do. Um, if not, there should be adults in the building who feel ready to have that conversation. Question for the evacs on that answer is, is there any way to protect, protect students who may come out the wrong faculty member who will try to do no harm to close by pressing their own conservative beliefs onto those students? Is 
They're a way to protect students who have come out. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Who, this is really well written. This has got me. Who may come out to the wrong faculty member, comma, who would try to do no harm by pressing his own conservative beliefs on the best. Yeah. So the teacher would try to change the student's um, Well, hopefully we equip and educate teachers that that's not a thing, that that's not, that's not something you should do, right? So that um, the, the advice that I always give teachers for students who've come out to them. Has anyone had anyone come out to them before? Anybody? And by come out, it means like you have disclosed that you're now LGBT. I always say the first thing, you should, it's like a gift, right? It can be a gift that you were expecting. <laughs> um, a gift that you <laughs> appreciate, a gift that you really don't like, right? However, no matter if someone gives you a gift, what do you say afterwards? Thank you, right? If someone chooses you, if a young person chooses you as that very special person that they are disclosing their LGBT identity with, that means they see something in you, right? They trust you in some way, that they are now trusting you with their identity. And so the first thing you should say is, thank you. The second thing you should say is, who else knows? Right, to start to do some safety planning. Things that aren't good to say, like, honey, I already knew, right? <laughs> the reason why that's not, and there are so many really well-meaning people who say that, like parents and friends, they're like, we knew you were gay, we were just waiting for you to come out, right? That might make this young person feel a little um, nervous about, like, wow, if you knew that I was gay, then, like, who else did, right? And so, even though it sounds really well-meaning, that's not advice I would give. And of course, I would never give advice like, are you sure? You should really think about that. Like, maybe it's just a phase. Um, or my favorite, what my grandmother used to say, have you been hanging around the wrong people? <laughs> so it's not your friends, you can't watch a cartoon and become gay, um, or trans. Um, so I would not give, you know, I would give the advice to teachers that if a student does disclose to them, if it's the wrong teacher, Please don't try and impart your own personal beliefs. We also know that not all teachers are equipped to have this conversation, right? So another thing you can say is, I really appreciate you giving me this information. I really do. However, I know that I'm not going to be able to do this conversation justice. I'm not going to be able to give you the support that you need. So I'm going to kindly refer you to someone who can. So Mr. Tillman or a school counselor. Um, and so that's another way you can sort of navigate these conversations. But what you shouldn't do is say, you're not really gay, you know, or anything like that. Um, we have two more questions that I can kind of combine. One is, is there an active GSA at Fair for Middle? There absolutely is. Um, Lily Richardson is the advisor of the GSA. She's the council chair at Fair for Middle. So if you're interested or need more info, Lily is the lady to contact. Um, she's wonderful. She does a great job. She has paired with Sam to do some activities together on the middle of high school. Uh -oh. And the question that comes after that is about GSA. Um, at what level of education is the GSA most beneficial to students? And can the GSA be started in an elementary school at what point is that point? So for the first question, I don't really have a clear answer for when a GSA is most beneficial. I would advise that middle school is a really great time to have a GSA. Um, I was a former middle school teacher, and we started the GSA at my middle school. Um, and it's a time where young people are questioning everything about themselves, right? Not just their identity around their gender or their sex, but like, what's their favorite color? And what foods do they like? And all these types of things. Um, and because middle school is a, a period of time where there's so much bullying and weird stuff, it's a perfect time for a GSA to exist in the building just to talk about things like empathy, respect, equity, all those types of things. Uh, but I can't really say when the best time is because high school GSAs are great. Um, I have the very strong belief that you can have a GSA at any age, right? Elementary schools could have GSAs. Many middle schools were seeing more and more that were having GSAs. And it makes folks a little skittish to think that, oh my gosh, my middle school student is, you know, at a GSA. Um, as someone who has started GSAs, builds them all over the state, it's important that we don't hypersexualize, right, the LGBT community, that many of these students in GSA meetings are talking about food and movies and their likes and their dislikes. 
And it's not always talking about sex or who I'm attracted to or anything like that. As long as you have a really great adult advisor and really great student leaders, some incredible conversations can happen at the middle school level. And middle school GSAs, I think, are incredible for building school culture, for um, you know, advertising what type of school that you want you know, your students to go to. Um, Listen has resources. One is called Ready, Set, Respect. And it's a toolkit for students K through five. Um, because we know that students get their earliest ideas of gender as early as two. Um, I used to actually teach preschool, right? And when I was a preschool teacher, which was hilarious, um, I would just like throw the kids around and drink their apple juice, and it was great. <laughs> uh, you would hear them on the playground, and they would say, well, that's not what a boy does, or that's not what a girl does. Those are really incredible opportunities to have conversations with young people about gender roles and gender expectations and saying, well, there's nothing specific that a girl does or nothing specific that a boy does. Or what's in a name? How did you get your name? How does it feel when people call you things other than your name? These are really great age-appropriate conversations that you can have with kids as young as pre-K around equity, respect, and diversity. Um, so I would argue with proper guidance, the GSA could be anywhere. Any questions from the audience? Yes. I just have one question. You had talked about if a child were to come to me and say that um, they were gay or whatever they wanted to tell me, and you told me I should not call a parent. Yes. What is the proper protocol if there's not a GSA at that school? So again, I would start to safety plan with the young person, right? Okay. So after they come out to you, and after you say, okay, who else knows? Because that informs a lot of what your next step is. They'll say, my parents know. Or my friends know, my parents don't know. Or you and Mr. Tillman knows. Um, so all of that informs your next step. Once you've answered that question, a good question is, what can I do for you? Right? What do you need? And let that young person say what they need. They can say, I need help coming out to my parents. Right? And then you can look at resources, contact the GSA, contact Listen, counseling, to have that conversation. Or I don't need anything, I just want someone to know and make me not feel weird. Um, so I always say let the young person lead what their needs are um, and go from there. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? I love questions. Okay, if you do, and if it comes up to you, um, you can always email me or give me a call. Um, we come out to anywhere, right? So I really appreciate this opportunity. This has been really wonderful. Um, I wish more high schools did this. this Great. Um, so thank you so much. One more question, yeah? So, as a teacher, how do you Great question. So the question was, as a teacher, how do you handle supporting and affirming the young person when they're in your presence, right, but also upholding the fact that their parent might not be aware of their gender identity? So the best ways I've seen it is to have those conversations with students and say something like, you know, does your parent know well, your name? If they are aware, if the parent is aware, if right. the parent comes into the school and firmly says, no, my child's name is Lisa, my child's name is a girl, do yeah. not call them James. True. But The advice that Glisten would give is for you to use your full power as a teacher in your classroom to affirm that student and use their name, right? Um, I'm not sure of any legal um, recourses that a parent could take to say, I told the teacher to do this and they didn't do that. I don't really know how that goes. But I know that teachers have to be sort of special advocates for students sometimes. And it gets really sticky anytime I'm talking about this conversation to talk about keeping information from parents, right? That's not anything that anyone likes to talk about or agree with. However, sometimes we have to be radical, right? And we have to affirm these young people. They have to get it somewhere. And so I would say that the parent doesn't really know what you're doing in first period, right? Unless they're spying on you. 
Uh, it also is really important to have the support of the administration, right? So if the administration can go to bat for you and say, actually, it's not standard practice that parents can march in here and say what name we call students, right? Like maybe that's not a thing. Um, so having the, the support of the administration, but our um, advice will always be to affirm the student. These are great questions. Yes? So the question was about safe space stickers? Oh, safe. Yeah, yeah, I think it's just so, a nice, you know, quick way for students to identify. Obviously, they're not going to tell you anything about sure. that relationship, but I just think it's nice. I don't know, it's just nice no, to it see is. that it's supportive. Like, even if they don't have you as a teacher, they don't know you. Right. No, safe space stickers have become one of the most powerful nonverbal clues that in the presence of this teacher, you know, they are going to respect my gender identity and my sexual orientation. Um, so we provide those safe space stickers, particularly after we have given a presentation to the staff. I've seen some schools who kind of use them as like, let me put them on my laptop and like my calendar. And we always say that safe space stickers are really powerful symbols, right? And if you are not equipped to put a safe space sticker on your door, then you shouldn't, right? And it's also not a decoration. Um, and so the fact that we have presented here, the fact that of course I know Mr. Tillman is presented here, we are happy to provide safe space stickers. Also, we get them for free from Glisten, and they're really expensive at Glisten.org. So let us send them to you because they're expensive all the time. And I'll just print them on labels. <laughs> so we're happy to provide uh, those safe space stickers as long as they're used uh, responsibly. So can I just say one more thing? Yes. If you, this is a guide that you can get on the internet, the, and I, that was a great question you asked, and so I was just looking, and so this is a, this Maryland State Department of Education get online. You can print it out. It's about 47 pages, and there's a section in here on page 11 that says non-description, non-discriminatory guidelines for disclosing information. And then in bold at the top, it says, always act in the best. So this is a message to teach. They're talking to teachers. Always act in the best interest of the child. Seek consultation and support, being sure to keep the student's identity anonymous. If unsure how to handle sensitive or complex situations, determine if the situation warrants an intervention at another level. So it would be the administration. But this is interesting because now they quote a little bit of, um, of, of law. It says, note that while a balance between students' rights to privacy and parents' rights to information in the educational environment is vital, no provision of state or federal law requires schools to affirmatively disclose the sensitive information to parents. Courts have recognized the constitutional right to medically to medical confidentiality concerning one's status as a transsexual person, and then they quote C. Powell versus Schreiner. This one says, federal courts have concluded that schools should not disclose sensitive student information such as sexual orientation to parents without a legitimate stated interest to do so, and then there's another quote here. So, and it goes on with the legal, so again, I think this is all cutting edge, new ground, and I think it's being written as it's occurring and it's being tested in the court systems. But this is, if you're interested, it's a good guide to have. I'll leave it up here, so if you want to reference it or take a picture of it and then go online and pick it up. Okay. And we were co-authors on that guide, so we like went line by line Really worked hard on them. So. Currently, Frederick is the only county in Maryland that has a specific, past, trans inclusive, comprehensive policy. Frederick County. Uh, with policy 443, I encourage you to look at it. Um, and so, what we're doing is Glisten is actually going around to all 24 counties and having them replicate a similar policy that they have in Frederick County. But there's a huge, hotly, you know, hot debate happening in Frederick County. However, I would not say Frederick County is like the most progressive county in Maryland, um, but they were able to pass this policy, and it's all really because of grassroots efforts, galvanizing teachers and students and community. So if it can happen in Frederick, um, it, it can happen in many places. Um, but I would encourage you to take a look at Frederick's policy, how that mirrors this policy. Glisten has a great model policy. Pittsburgh has a great policy. New York City has a good policy. Uh, but hopefully we can bring this to all 24 counties in Maryland. 
Let's give Jabari another round of applause. Thank you.